Is it a great day to be a Christian? If you have your Bible, turn to Matthew chapter 23. Matthew chapter 23. Jesus hated pride. And he used the Pharisees as an example of how we're not supposed to act. So that's what we're going to be looking at tonight. Matthew chapter 23, and I start reading in verse number 1. Then spake Jesus to the multitude and to his disciples, saying, The scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. All therefore whatsoever they bid you observe, that observe and do, but do not ye after their works, for they say and do not. For they bind heavy burdens and grievous to be borne and lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. But all their works they do for to be seen of men. They make broad their phylacteries and enlarge the borders of their garments and love the uppermost rooms at feasts and the chief seats in the synagogues and greetings in the markets and to be called of men, Rabbi, Rabbi. But be not ye called Rabbi, for one is your master, even Christ, and all ye are brethren. And call no man your father upon the earth, for one is your father which is in heaven. Neither be ye called masters, for one is your master, even Christ. But he that is greatest among you shall be your servant. Whosoever shall exalt himself shall be abased. He that shall humble himself shall be exalted. Last night we started talking about the upside down lessons of Jesus, of the upside down teachings. And tonight we're going to continue that theme and talk about the first being last, the last being first. And the way the world looks at things, that's, that's upside down. That's backwards. That doesn't make much sense. But that's what we're going to talk about tonight. Heard a story about a poor West Tennessee dirt farmer. You may know some folks like that. Uh, and he was an older fellow. He'd been farming for a long time. And he lived way out in the country, and so he didn't have much company. And one day he was surprised to see this big green SUV driving down the dirt road to his farm. The SUV pulled up in his yard, a city slicker and a big shiny windbreaker got out and said, USDA, embroidered on the back. He walked across and he said, Howdy, sir, said, I am with the United States Department of Agriculture, and I've been tasked to come out and check out all the farming operations in this area, so I'm going to go and look at everything you're doing. See, uh, check out, examine your farming practices. And the old farmer said, well, said, uh, I, I don't cotton too much with having strangers poking around my business. I'd just soon you not do that. The young man reached in his jacket, pulled out his credentials, held them up in the farmer's face and said, you see that badge? That badge says I can go anywhere I want to, anytime I want to, and do anything I want to, and there's nothing you can do about it. And the old farmer says, well, so I, I don't want any problems with the government. If, if you can do that, I guess you can go ahead. Go look at anything I got, but you need to stay out of that field right behind the barn. Don't go in that field. And the man looked at him again. He said, did you see this badge? This badge says I can go anywhere I want to, and you can't stop me. And then just to prove his point, he took a couple of quick steps, put his hands on the rail, jumped over into the field that the farmer told him he couldn't go. And he walked about 100 yards across that field, and then he came face to face with the biggest, meanest, ugliest looking bull he'd ever seen. Bull snorted a time or two, started pawing the ground, started charging after the young man. The young man started running back towards the fence, screaming, help me, please help me. And the old farmer screamed out and said, show him your badge, mister. What was that young man's problem? Well, other than the bull chasing him, his problem was he was proud. He was arrogant. He knew everything there was to know about farming, and he wasn't going to let some old farmer tell him what he could and couldn't do. The uh, Bible says in one of the most misquoted Proverbs of all, Proverbs 16, 18, we usually quote that as pride goeth before fall. That's not what it says. It says, Pride goeth before destruction, and a haughty spirit before a fall. And that was this young man's problem. He had a haughty spirit. He thought pretty highly of himself, and he was about to take a fall. Uh, things weren't going his way. The Pharisees, the teachers of the law, had that same problem. Uh, if there was a place of honor at the head of the table, that's where they wanted to sit. If there was a title 
the, of honor. They wanted to be called that. They wanted to be called rabbi or teacher or people look up to them. If there was praise to be received, they wanted to get it. They wanted people to tell them how righteous they were and how good they were and how kind they were and how loving they were. And they wanted everybody to be impressed. And the truth is that up until Jesus came, it seemed like everybody was impressed. Uh, the Pharisees were real, well respected. They were well thought of by everybody except Jesus. He, he didn't think much of the Pharisees. And the reason he didn't think much of them, think much of them, is because they were proud. James 4 verse 6 says, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. If you look in the Bible for the words proud and pride, uh, you'll see that it's not a very good thing in Scripture. Let's start back in Leviticus. Leviticus chapter 26, verses 18 and 19, God declares this, If ye will not yet for all this hearken unto me, then I will punish you seven times more for your sins, and I will break the pride of your power. I will make your heaven as iron and your earth as brass. In other words, God says, if you're too proud to listen to me, if you get to thinking so much of yourself, you're not going to listen to me, then it's not going to rain and your crops are not going to grow. You're going to have problems if you're so proud that you won't listen to God. Turn to the book of Psalms. Psalm number 10, verse 4 says this. The wicked, through the pride of his countenance, will not seek after God. God is not in all his thoughts. When you get proud, you don't have room for God. You don't think about God. You leave God out. Pride makes it so that there's no room for God in our lives. Turn over to Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy 8.14 Moses warns the Israelites about letting thine heart be lifted up and thou forget the Lord thy God which brought thee forth out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. Uh, the King James said thine heart be lifted up. The New American Standard said their hearts would become proud. The idea is they get so full of themselves, they get so haughty, they get so proud that uh, they forget God. They forget who got them where they are. They forget who led them into this land of plenty. Who gave them these cities that they didn't build? Pride can make it so that we forget God. And James chapter 4 takes it one step further than that. James seems to be saying that pride can make us enemies with God. Uh, look at James 4 starting in verse 4. James wrote, Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of of God. Do ye think that the scripture saith in vain, the spirit that dwelleth in us lusteth to envy? But he giveth more grace, wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. Submit yourselves therefore to God, resist the devil, he will flee from you, draw nigh to God, he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, purify your hearts, ye double minded. Pride seems to make us want to seek friendship with the world. A pride seeks power and position and prominence and they seek it from the world, from the people of the earth. Pride lies at the heart of wanting to be a friend of the world and enemies with God. Think about what's happening in our culture today. A lot of people that we know want everybody to like them. They want everybody to think well of them. Because of that, they're ashamed to take biblical positions on things like abortion or homosexuality because if they say something about what the Bible says about these things, their friends won't like them anymore. Uh, the politicians won't get any votes if they stand up. Even the ones that claim to be religious, claim to follow God's word, they say, well, I don't personally believe that, but they're not going to speak against it. They're not going to vote against it because they want the popularity. They want the power that comes from it. Uh, that makes them proud. It makes them want to be a friend of the world. And God says, don't be proud. I don't want to forget God. I don't want to crowd him out of my life. I don't want to make him my enemy. So I need to avoid being proud. To do that, we need to take a lesson from the Pharisees and the teachers of the law. 
Uh, everybody's good for something, and they're good for bad examples. These are the people that are doing things that we don't need to follow. We don't want to do what they did. Well, what did they did? What did they do? Everything they did seemed to be to get attention, to get noticed. When they prayed, they stood on the street corner and prayed out loud so that everybody would see how prayerful they were. Uh, when they fasted, they wanted you to understand how much they suffered because of that. So they'd get in sackcloth and ashes and they'd make sad faces and sit there looking really hungry so that you could tell how earnest they were. When they gave something, they wanted everybody to know how much they were giving so that you would think how generous they were. And they were getting that kind of attention. People were thinking that. And then Jesus came along and he started talking that he wasn't too impressed with these Pharisees. Let's look at the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6, verses 3 and 4, Jesus warned us that our giving should be in secret. Verse 3 says, But when thou doest alms, let not thy left hand know what thy right hand doeth, that thy alms may be in secret, and thy Father which seeth in secret himself shall reward thee openly. Pharisees came in blowing a trumpet when they gave everybody, look at me. Jesus said, don't even let your left hand know what your right hand's doing. Give in secret. Uh, Matthew chapter 6, verses 5 and 6, he taught that our prayers were not to be for show. Uh, verse 5 says, and when thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are, for they love to pray, standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the streets, that they may be seen of men. Verily I say, unto you they have their reward but thou when thou prayest enter into thy closet when thou hast shut thy door pray to thy father which is in secret and thy father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly and skip down to verses 16 and 18 or 16 through 18 he contrasted the way that the pharisees did their fasting to the way he wanted his followers to fast Moreover, when you fast, be not as the hypocrites of a sad countenance, for they disfigure their faces, that they may appear unto men to fast. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. But thou, when thou fastest, anoint thine head, wash thy face, that thou appear not unto men to fast, but unto thy Father which is in secret, and thy Father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. Christian piety shouldn't be done for a show. We shouldn't be doing things so that people will pay attention to us, but that's what proud people do. They want everybody to know how good they are, how righteous they are, how generous they are. We do need to be serious about our praying and about our giving, but we need to make sure that we're almost secretive about it because the only one that we want to impress is God. But proud people don't think like that. They want to be noticed. They want to be at the front of the line. They want the best seats at the table. They want everybody to pay attention to their accomplishments. Uh, they want to get to the head of the line, but Jesus said the way to do that is to go to the back of the line. But that doesn't make sense to people. So Matthew 20, 16 says that's the way it works. The last shall be first and the first last. It's one of Jesus' upside down teachings. It doesn't seem to make sense to the rest of the world, but God's saying if he wants to lift you up, it doesn't matter where you are in line, he'll put you where he wants you to be. He'll put you where you need to be. He'll give you the reward that you deserve, but we need to make sure that we're seeking rewards from God and not seeking the praises of men. Uh, the people that want to do it themselves kind of tend to believe the proverb that God helps them that help themselves. You've probably heard people say, God helps them that helps themselves, and they say it like it's from the Bible, they wish it were in the Bible, but that's not what the Bible says. The Bible doesn't say that God helps them who help themselves. God helps those that humble themselves. God helps those that submit themselves to his will. God helps those that seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. Those are the people that God will bless. He doesn't want us to help ourselves. He wants to help others. He wants us to be serving others. But do they do that? No, because they want the attention of man. They don't want to humble themselves because they want the praises of man. And that happens sometimes in the church because before we became Christians, we were part of the world too. That's how we thought. That's how we lived. 
And sadly, sometimes that still happens today. I've been at meetings of elders of the Lord's Church that divided up into this, they divided themselves up into little cliques. The, the elders of the big church all hung together, and the elders of the little churches all got together. Uh, they were kind of a hierarchy. They weren't told to do that. They just thought that, you know, we're better than these little church people, so we need to all hang together. That's pride. That's not seeking God's will. Uh, one of the ways that we can avoid pride is to avoid something that the world thinks a lot about, and that's titles. Uh, look at Matthew chapter 23. Jesus is talking about the pride of the Pharisees in Matthew 23, verse 6. He says that they love the uppermost rooms at feasts and the chief seats in the synagogues and greetings in the markets and to be called of men, Rabbi, Rabbi. Now look at verse 8. But be not ye called Rabbi, for one is your master, even Christ, and all ye are brethren. Call no man your father upon the earth, for one is your father which is in heaven. Neither be ye called masters, for one is your master, even Christ. But he that is greatest among you shall be your servant. Whosoever shall exalt himself shall be abased. He that shall humble himself shall be exalted. Skip the titles. Don't worry about what people call you. Don't want to be called master or rabbi or any of these things. Verse 8 says, Be ye not called rabbi, for one is your master, even Christ, and all ye are brothers, are brethren. We're not supposed to be called rabbi. We're not supposed to be looking for titles because we're all brothers and sisters. That's why in the church we don't get into titles. We don't call our preachers reverend or, or pastor. Reverend means someone we hold in awe. Uh, I don't think any of you hold me in awe. I don't think that I'm somebody that you're just amazed when I walk into the room. The Bible only uses the word reverend one time, the whole scripture. That's in Psalm 111.9. Psalm 111.9 says this, Holy and reverend is his name. And that his is talking about God. If you want to call somebody God, God is reverend. We don't deserve that title. We shouldn't use that title. Nobody else should either. Now, the word pastor is used in the Bible to talk about people, but it's not preachers that it's talking about. It's elders. I know some pastors. I know some pastors who preach. But they're elders, and they don't call themselves pastors because it's confusing. They call themselves shepherds or bishops or overseers, elders. All those are the terms for the same people, but none of those people are just preachers. Uh, preachers are not pastors. So what should you call the preacher? Well, here you need to call him Ken. Uh, that's, that's me. If you want to call me Brother Ken, that's okay because we're all brethren. I'm Brother Ken. There's Brother Johnny. Got Brother Joe here tonight. Sister Regina, that's a description. That's who we are. That's not a title. That's not somebody that, that we're supposed to look up to because there's somebody special. Now, if somebody that's not a member of the church calls me brother, I don't correct them because like Marshall Keeble used to say, we're all brothers. If I can't get you through Jesus, I'll get you through Adam. We're all in this together. We're all brethren, but that's not a title. That's just a term of endearment. That's just a term of fellowship. But there's some places that insist uh, that we use titles, that they get called the right title. I read about one uh, church that said everybody here that's a preacher should be pastor. Uh, their head preacher is the lead pastor. Their youth preacher is the youth pastor. Everybody that has a work is called pastor. Somebody says, why do you do that? And it says, because if they don't have that title, it undermines their authority. We're not supposed to have authority in the church. God is the authority. God's the one that's reverend. He's the one we're supposed to look up to. Everybody else is just somebody, just a person, just a brother or sister in the Lord. We don't need titles because we shouldn't be looking for authority. Jesus said in Matthew 23, 11, that the greatest among you shall be your servant. So if I want to be a person of influence in God's church, I need to be looking for somebody to help. I need to become a servant uh, Real servants don't have titles. They have mops and brooms and towels. They're out working. They're out trying to help other people. Uh, the need for a title can emphasize somebody's inner pride. Uh, an over preacher, a denominational preacher that went to school, became a doctorate of divinity 
or got his doctorate of divinity and then he didn't want to be called pastor anymore. He said, I paid a lot of money to get that title of doctor and I want everybody to call me doctor. Uh, it seems a doctor is better than a regular pastor. And he wanted everybody to realize what he'd accomplished, what he'd done, what had happened to that man. He got caught up in pride. Uh, we don't need to compete for titles. We don't need to worry about getting respect. We need to make sure that we're doing what we need to do. There's a symptom that can show that we've fallen into that trap, that we've gotten too proud. You ever gotten irritated at somebody because they didn't pay you the right amount of respect? You didn't treat me the way you should have, and that makes me mad. You didn't give me the right attention. I read about a lady in a church that got mad at the preacher's wife because she gave her something, she didn't send her a thank you note. And so she went around talking about, can you believe she didn't send me this note? She never sent me a thank you note. She didn't do what I deserved. That's pride. When we, don't, when we get all upset, when we feel slighted because people didn't treat us the way that we deserve to be treated, our pride is acting up. God says we don't need to act like that. We don't need to be like the Pharisees. We don't need to be like the teachers of the law. Uh, we don't need to be appreciated. We need to be servants. Remember what Jesus said, Matthew chapter 6, verse 2. Therefore, when thou doest thine alms, do not sound the trumpet before thee as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets. He said they sounded a horn. Why do they sound a horn? Look at the rest of the verse. That they may have glory of men. Look at me. See what I'm doing. Don't you want to give me recognition? Don't, want, don't you want to thank me? For my generosity, the rest of that verse is, they have their reward. If you want somebody's attention, if that's why you're doing something, somebody pays attention, that's all the reward you're going to get. That's not why we're supposed to do things. We want rewards from God. I read a true story about a wealthy woman that needed some wood chopped. She didn't have anybody to chop her wood. She happened to look out one day and saw this gentleman walking down the street. She ran out and said, sir, excuse me, but would, would you like to earn a few dollars? I've got some wood that needs to be chopped. And the old gentleman smiled and took off his jacket, rolled up his sleeves, got out of the ax and went and chopped up the wood. He finished and she thanked him, gave him a few dollars and he went on his way. And then this little servant girl went up to her and whispered in her ear. The next morning, she went to that man's office full of apologies and said, I didn't know that it was you that I was asking to chop my wood. And he said, it's perfectly all right, madam. Occasionally, I enjoy a little manual labor. Besides, it's always a delight to do something for a friend. Soon after that, that appreciative woman got with all her other rich friends, and they all sent lots of donations and ended up sending thousands of dollars to the Tuskegee Institute because the man that had chopped her wood was Booker T. Washington. She just thought some guy was walking down the street and she'd see if he'd like to earn a dollar. She was proud. She didn't think that she might, who else she might be talking to, but he was humble. He was willing to do work for somebody that was taking advantage of him, that didn't recognize him. He didn't say, lady, you don't know who you're talking to. I'm the head of the Tuskegee Institute. I'm a wealthy professor. I'm a college teacher. I do all these things. He just chopped her wood. Because of that, uh, she ended up being a, a supporter of his institute. Lesson tonight hasn't been about obeying the gospel. Everyone here has already obeyed the gospel. Anybody that's watching this, if you're not, you need to be a Christian. It's the only life worth living, the only death one would dare to die. But for those of us who are Christians, we let our pride get in the way sometimes. Are we serving people the way we need to be serving or do we expect people to be serving us? Jesus says the first will be last and the last shall be first. If we want to be first in his kingdom, then we need to make sure that we're not letting pride get in our way. We need to do something about that tonight. Won't you do it right now? We stand together as we sing.